I've been in our series called Simple. Uh, we tend to make the gospel very complicated, and Jesus came and he simplified the gospel for us. And Jesus' initial invitation wasn't to obey. Jesus' initial invitation was to simply, what? Follow, that's right. He invited us to follow him, to get to know him, to spend some time with him, to find out who he was. And then after you begin to understand what Jesus is about, who he is through listening uh, to his teaching, by being around him, by spending some time with him, by maybe reading the Bible and understanding who the Bible says that Jesus is, by being around other Christians in a church setting, by experiencing the grace of God, you are invited to take another simple step of faith. And from follow, we are invited to believe. Not necessarily all the teaching of Jesus, although that's so important and, and that's so incredible, but the fundamental basis for the gospel is who Jesus is. Believing in who Jesus is, that he is the son of the living God. When you believe someone has your best interest in mind, when you believe that you are open to his or her influence, you're open to his or her ideas, you're open to their advice, their suggestions, and their request. When you fall in love with someone and, and, and you have his or her best interest in mind, you do the same thing. They do the same thing. Those are what relationships are sometimes built on. This is why Jesus said to follow. Jesus said to watch. Jesus said to experience before he asked for this final step of faith. And so we follow, we believe, and our third step is to obey. That's where we go. A lot of times we get this wrong in church. We begin with obedience, don't we? In fact, it's obey or else, right? And obey or else or you're in big trouble. And we put obey and then believe and then follow and actually, we got to follow and then believe and then obey. And this is illustrated throughout the Bible. But one place this is illustrated the best is in the giving of the Ten Commandments. When did God give the Ten Commandments? Did he give the Ten Commandments and then establish a relationship with his people? No. If you think about that story carefully, God delivered a people from the, from the nation of Egypt, from Pharaoh. They were enslaved for 400 years. And God raised up a leader and sent this leader to, to, to this people that he knew in, in this land. And, and when he got there, Pharaoh wouldn't let him go. And so God miraculously delivered his people through nine plagues. The 10th plague was the final straw. Get out of our country. And they actually had a change in mind and, and they sent the Israelites out and, and it was the hand of God that moved Pharaoh's heart. And it didn't stop there. The Pharaoh woke up the next morning and went, who's gonna you know, build these pyramids? Who's going to do all this slave labor? What have I done? And so he sent the army uh, of Egypt after the Israelites and they chased them to the Red Sea and they were trapped. They thought, did you bring us out here to kill us? They still weren't sure of this God that had delivered them from Egypt. And God put this giant wall of flame, this giant pillar of, of fire between the, Israel, uh, between the Israelites and the Egyptian army. And they had a million people to get across the Red Sea. And it would not take a, a couple of minutes, right? God parted the Red Sea and literally a million people walked across. But that could have taken a day or two. That could have taken a long time. And God kept that pillar of fire there. God delivered the people of Israel from the Egyptian army. And then when all the people were across the Red Sea safely on the other side, God lifted the pillar of fire and the Pharaoh and his army began to chase them again. And when they got into the middle of the sea, God destroyed Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Red Sea, wiping them out, and Israel never lifted a spear, never lifted a bow, never had to fight in any way. God miraculously delivered their people. And then they found themselves in a desert, and God showed up again to deliver them from hunger and, and sent this substance that they called manna. Literally, what is it? They had no idea what this white, flaky stuff is. 
and, and they put it on the ground and they kept it and they ate it and it was a delicious, sweet honey bread. And, and it was a, a heavenly bread that God sent them. I guess good nutrition and it sustained them. And then God took them to Sinai and said, here's a couple of things I want you to do. This is what I want you to do because this is going to make your life better. And it would be like, well, duh, of course, after all that you have done for us, after you've delivered us, if you've shown yourself so faithful, when we've got to know who you are, of course, we will obey you. And that's what they said. Have you ever been bailed out of a mess by someone out of the kindness of their heart? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, it's happened to all of us. And didn't you want to do something for that person in return? To the extent that they sacrifice for you, you want to sacrifice for them. And God always seems to give me illustrations for my sermon the week. That, and so we went to this cool little restaurant for the second time called Rum. That's just a plug for Rum because it's in Patchog and it's so good. It's brand new. It's owned by Cowfish and, and the other restaurants in Hampton Bays. This one's in Patchogue. And, 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 and we went there this week again for a date night because we just love the place. It's so cute. And uh, we were there and we were paying, you know, Patchogue, they love their parking meters. And you can't get anywhere near town without paying to park. And, and we've operated them before. And, you know, they're the same ones in the city. And you just, you put your card in and max it out and, you know, do all that. And, and, and so it's, it's pretty easy. You put your parking space in. Well, this lady was an elderly lady and old, older, you know, and, and she, she came up and she, I, she didn't know how to work the machine. And so we said, what's your parking space number? And we helped her get it in and we scanned her card and it came back as an unreadable card. You know, the magnetic strip on the back, you know, whatever. We tried it again, you know, unreadable card. So I just put my card in and, and hit the button and didn't think anything of it. You know, just a couple bucks. And, and she didn't have any cash on her and was like, I can't believe you did that. Nobody's ever done that for me before. And I'm like, really, it's, just a, it's, it's okay, it's okay. And, and she ended up at the same restaurant we were in, a couple tables, and I didn't, didn't even see her come in in the beginning. And, and she plopped four dollars on the table. And I went, it's okay, really. It's like she couldn't believe somebody did that. And, and I don't know, and all of a sudden at the end of our meal, we get this dessert <laughs> delivered to us. And I'm like, she was so overwhelmed with a little bit of generosity and she delivered, have you ever had tres leches? Let me, let me just tell you, at rum, it's like over the top good. And I can't believe I'm talking about this much food. But I'm just telling you, there are rewards to following the Lord and to obeying Jesus and generosity. So, so listen, that's just a little example. When you give somebody a little bit, they just, people are just, you know, it's just you want to do something in return. And no matter how small or how big that is, so God, he sent his only begotten son. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And Jesus began to teach us. That's one of the reasons he came was to show us all that God is like. And he did. He showed us what God, you know, we can relate to God, how we can relate to him, what God is like. He is father. He is a, a, a more familiar term, daddy. He is, he is all these things and how we can relate and talk to him and how we can approach him and, and how he wants a relationship, not just the checkbox re religion that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So he told us how to relate to him. He explained God to us. And then Jesus at the end of his ministry did something even more amazing. We broke God's law and we found ourselves in such need. And Jesus paid that fine for us. He paid the penalty for our, our sins by giving his own blood, his own life as a ransom for our sin to redeem us from all the penalty that we deserve. And so he came to explain, he came to die for our sins. And then he did something even more amazing. He gave us the promised Holy Spirit that when we take that step of, of faith to follow, when we take that step of faith to believe, and when we take the final step that we're talking about today, obey, Jesus promises to come and live in us through his Holy Spirit. How can you say no to what he might have for us in the obedience step? How could you say no when it all finally sinks in of exactly who Jesus is? Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. He says you know, a lot of things. You can read it for yourself on the screen here. But he says God's kindness leads us toward repentance. 
In other words, it's irresistible. We can't, we have to go to it once we discover what he's really like. The other thing is when someone asked us to do something, when someone asked us to do something, it is so natural for us to wonder what's in it, what we're going to get out of it, especially if there's some sacrifice involved on our part. And following Christ, there certainly is some sacrifice on our part. Following Jesus will lead you to a major departure from cultural norms. You're going to be looked at a little strange when your integrity raises up a little bit more in your office than maybe your coworkers or maybe what your boss expects to close a deal. And you can't go that far with him in, in, in saying those promises that just aren't the truth. Or maybe when you take a stand of faith and you say, I'm not going to have sex with you outside of marriage. Maybe your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever will, 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 will say that's weird. And maybe your reputation will be hampered in high school or college or whatever when you take that stand. Whatever it is, wherever you find it, culture goes one way and, and, and God's word seems to go in a completely different direction. And you might even seem a little bit weird and that can be scary. I get that. But that's the jumping off point for many, many, many people. I'll follow and I'll believe. But that doing part, that's a whole nother level. That's a whole different experience. I have simply too much to lose. Move out? God, are you kidding me? I can't afford rent without that person living with me. Forgive after all that they have done to me, you want, them, you want me to forgive them? Tell the truth? Nobody tells the truth on those fishing stories. Are you kidding, God? Uh, commit to purity? Really? Nobody does that anymore. Give up my weekend activities to sing a few songs and hear a message? What? Confess? Really, I have to confess when I've done something dumb? Commit to generosity? Don't you know I'm saving for retirement? Don't you know there's things that are more important than generosity? I love you, but. I love you, but. And part of our problem in life is our frame of reference, which is about a week, by the way. We see what's going to happen when we adopt this lifestyle in our work. We, we see what's going to happen when we adopt this lifestyle in our personal life. We see what's going to happen tomorrow or next week in our life, but we don't consider 20 years down the road when we build our life on a foundation of integrity. When we put God first in our finances, yes, it's going to cost us something now, but as we get rid of the greed in our life, as we get rid of those roots in our life of bitterness through forgiveness, as we get rid of these things that, that, that culture puts first, as we get rid of them and we take on this weird philosophy in a way at least the world thinks it's weird as we put that on we don't look at our life 20 years down the road we don't see far enough into the future we think of the impact tomorrow but not in a generation it affects our children and our children's children when we adopt the ways of the world and it affects our children and our children's children when we adopt the ways of God I believe I want to keep following. I want to trust you. I want to do what you say, but it's so hard. So Jesus, he addresses this at the end of his most famous sermon he ever preached. One of his most challenging sermons that he ever preached. A sermon, his first sermon that he ever preaches. He says this, Matthew 7, verse 24. He says, therefore... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, makes them a lifestyle, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He built his house on the rock. This is a story about doing. This is not a story about attending. This is not a story about just hearing. This goes beyond all of that. 
This is a man who decided to build his house close to a river. We'll see that in the next verse. There's some waterfront property, some riverfront property. It's going to be gorgeous, this house. But he's smart enough to know you don't put it right next to the river. That you go up on the hill. And you don't just go up on the hill a little bit. You dig down until you hit something substantial because the waters are going to rise. The storms are going to come. And we got to anchor that house down to a firm foundation we got to dig until we find rock he built his house on a solid solid foundation and the implication is this man is deciding not just to hear who jesus is not just to follow who jesus is but to do what jesus says jesus goes on the rain came down and the what stream rose because there was a flood time every year and this happened and the winds blew and beat against that house yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock obedience jesus was saying obedience is the same thing as laying a firm foundation that prepares you it prepares your life for the storms the inevitable storms that are going to come But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now, depending on who you believe Jesus is at this point, uh, everybody knows this. And this seems so arrogant of Jesus to even say because it's so obvious It's so offensive because it's so obvious. It's like, what do you think we are? Third graders that you have to tell us not to build our house on sand? Uh, This man, he is taking the easy way. This man that Jesus is talking about. When this man up on the hill is building his house, he's still going to be digging down to the foundation. He's going to be anchoring into those rocks. He's going to get his, his, his concrete nail gun and pounding those things in and anchoring that thing from the, from, the, from the foundation all the way to the roof. It's all going to be tied together. But, but that takes time. This man is going to put some poles in the ground and start nailing up two by fours and get some drywall on. And he'll be moved in before that guy's got his floor poured, before he's got the sides of his house even delivered by Home Depot. He's going to, the first guy, the second guy, he's going to be done. He's going to, the U-Haul truck will have moved the stuff in already. It's going to be great. He's going to finish much quicker. It's going to be much cheaper for him. And he's going to be closer to the water. How great is that? He's going to hear the stream at night when the windows are open. It's going to be fantastic. But after he finished building, what happened? Nothing at first. Absolutely nothing happened at first. Everything seemed to be going just fine. In fact, his life even seemed better than the other man because he's still working hard. And then verse 27, the rain came down, the same stream rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Perhaps the same storm. How long did he wait? We don't know. Verse 28, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Jesus isn't threatening hell. He's talking about your future. He's talking about the future, but he's talking about your future and my future. In this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he had just unloaded a brand new value system. He just told his hearers a whole different way of living than what was the cultural norms of that day. Heads were spinning. They were reeling on on all the thoughts that were going through their mind. Lust is the same as adultery. What man is innocent of that? Turn the other cheek. If someone strikes you, Jesus, you want me to offer him a second cheek to hit? I'm going to have two sore jaws. If someone wants a favor, Jesus, if someone wants my cloak, you want me to give him my tunic as well? If someone wants me to walk one mile with him, you want me to walk two miles? You want me to do more than people ask? Money isn't all that important. 
You want me to give my money away when someone asks me? And you don't even give a percentage? I mean, you're like expecting just far more than what the Old Testament said? What is up with that? Forgive no matter what, even if it feels to me like I'm letting the other person off the hook. You want me to just forgive? You want me to pursue someone that sinned against me even if I haven't done anything wrong? Who does that? You want me to leave my gift at the altar if my brother might have something against me and go and be reconciled before I worship you? You want me to treat others the way that I want to be treated? I mean, we've always heard treat others the way that they've treated me, right? I mean, that's like the, no, 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 treat others the way that you want them to treat you. That's a whole nother level. The, the look in their eyes must have been amazing. How can I possibly apply all of this to my life? How, how can I possibly, I'll lose out. I'll lose out the, 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 my community will think I'm crazy. Knowing that he didn't have time to deal with every objection. Knowing that he didn't have time to deal with every single issue that somebody might raise. He ended his message with a simple little parable that we just went through to alleviate their concerns and motivate them to action. Going, motivate them to doing. So Jesus is talking about doing versus not doing. Doing versus not doing. And again, Jesus isn't threatening hell in this story. Jesus is saying that it doesn't work long term the other way. You have a choice. You can go the world's way or you can go his way, but you can't do both. Jesus is saying, I'm not trying to get you to obey me so that I can love you. I'm trying to get you to obey me because I love you. Jesus is saying, I don't want something from you. I want something for you in your life. I'm trying to get you to obey me because I love you. Friends, you're going to hit bumps financially. You're going to hit bumps in your relationships. You're going to hit bumps professionally. And when that happens... Jesus doesn't want your life to fall down. The goal of the Christian faith is this. The goal is to be so convinced of who Jesus is and so grateful for what Jesus has done that you willingly choose to do what Jesus says. This parable comes either as a comfort or as a warning or as an explanation for you today. In one of the three categories, you're going to find your life. But for all of us, it comes as a promise. For those of you who are seeking to build your life around the teaching of Jesus, for those of you who are seeking to do what Jesus says, you've taken the step of, of follow, you, 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 you've been convinced of who Jesus is, and now you believe that he is the Son of God, and now you want to take that step of obedience, and you're building your life on what Jesus says, then you are going to find comfort in the words of Jesus. You're going to come, find comfort in the morality when it flies in the face of culture and you look weird. You're going to find yourself in comfort on the decisions that you're making because you're seeing the long-term ramification. Sex outside of marriage. I've never met a person yet in my life that said sex outside of, of a holy ordained marriage, a God-ordained marriage that made their life better. It always brought incredible complexities and relationship difficulties in their life. Maybe for a while it seemed all wonderful, but then stuff starts to set in. Problems start to happen. Relationship struggles start to take place. Take comfort in raising your family with all the sacrifices that you're going to be making. S comfort in, in having a godly marriage the way that he says a marriage is supposed to be made. Uh, comfort in the fact that you'll have finances that'll, that, that will be loosed of the, the, the framework of greed in your life because you'll be a life of generosity and that takes greed and loosens it. And, and once greed is loosened, not only can a little bit more get out, but a lot more can get in. Your hand is open 
It seems counterintuitive. It seems counterproductive. But God always comes through. Take comfort in your business because your integrity will be higher than your competition. And in the long term, in the short term, that may be a bad thing. But in the long term, your customers will see that they, you can be trusted. Take comfort in what you allow to go into your minds because as you adopt purity as your covenant to God, your conscience will be clear. You'll live a life without regrets as you put these things that Jesus tells you into practice. But for those of you who didn't know all that Jesus had said here, for those of you who kind of wrote what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, this lust thing and, and all these purity things and all this, you know, turning the other cheek. As you say, this is just isn't our culture. That may be for back in the first century, but that's not how we live now. It's so irrelevant. It's so yesterday, right? Listen, take, take warning of that. Take a warning for this. It's a warning to you because obedience is inconvenient at times. Obedience is so costly at times. It may cost you a sale. It may cost you a relationship. It may cost you uh, amazing things. But you'll be thinking, what am I wasting my time with obedience for? There's not a cloud in the sky. There's no storm on the horizon. I know I should be careful about, more careful about what I put into my minds, but what's the harm? I don't see any gray clouds in the sky. I know what the Bible says about sex, but where's the storm? Where's the danger? Besides, have you ever heard this? I've heard this a million times. It won't happen to me. <laughs> Time will tell. Time will tell. My suggestion to you is you're just looking, not looking far enough into the future. You're looking about a week out, not 20 years out, not a generation out. And the problem is you think you have a lot of time, but you don't have that much time. You only have but one life to live. You only have one first marriage. You only have one year to be 21. You only have one body to manage. You only have one season in your life to be 30. You only have one season in your life to teach your young children the ways of the Lord. You only have one freshman year to live in college. Others of you are right in the middle of a storm this morning. And this scripture provides the explanation for what's happening in your life right now. You're standing on the riverbank of life watching your life wash away. Your marriage going down the drain. Your kids are no longer talking to you. Your business has imploded. Your reputation is going down river faster than you can catch it. You, you thought before you came here today that God was just mad at you or maybe that God was just unjust and treating you badly. But perhaps this is just the outcome of a life that was built on a foundation that was destined to erode away anyway. Perhaps God has you here today for the purpose of understanding what you've built your life on in the past. For you, this is also an invitation to gather what you have left over, what hasn't been destroyed, what can be salvaged in your life, and to head up to some higher ground and to dig a new foundation built on the rock of life and to set a firm foundation and actually start over. It's no surprise that so many people return to faith or come to faith for the first time after part or all of their life comes crashing down around them. That's what it takes for us to realize that our foundation that we were building on was built on sand. But at the end of the day, it comes down to this, this simple little truth. Who are you going to trust? Who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust in your own abilities and your own understanding? 
as limited as it is, as wonderful as it may seem, but as limited as it is, don't you know anything about God by now that his understanding is limitless, truly limitless? That he created life and he knows how life works best. And he gives us these instructions, again, not to get something from us, but to get something for us because he knows what works best and what fails miserably. Are you going to, are you going to, to work and live on your own understanding or are you going to trust your saviors? Are you going to trust God Almighty? Solomon said it this way, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. That amazing? At the end of the day, this is a parable about faith. Whose advice are you going to trust? Will you take Jesus at his word and live in constant obedience to him? trusting that he really does know what's best for you? Or will you lean on your own understanding of how things appear to work and do things your own way? But this is not a parable about blind faith. A lot of skeptics say it, just following Jesus is all about blind faith, but there's nothing blind about what Jesus is explaining here. We live in a society full of illustrations of those who have chosen obedience to God. And we see their lives in sharp contrast because in this world we also see a whole bunch of people, probably more people, who have built their house on the sand. They have built their lives on nothing but sand. And they've re reaped the the devastating consequences of the weather beating against the house and everything, the reputation, everything crashing in around them. This is not blind faith. This is no duh. Of course this makes sense. We see it contrasted both ways. Those who have built themselves on sex, all kinds of sex with everything that moves and how destructive and how, how polluted and how devastating and how infectious their life is. And we've seen those who have dedicated their lives to purity, not only in their sex life, but also their thought life, and said, I'm not going to put garbage in, garbage out. Even the, the, the secular world knows that phrase, but they don't apply it to life. Who are you going to trust? All we need to do beyond looking at the world is look in the rearview mirror of our own lives. And we see when we've made decisions that honor God where they have taken us. And when we see when we've made decisions that haven't honored God where that has taken us. Attending and hearing is not life changing. Don't miss that today. We live in a culture, especially our culture here in East Mariches, where it's all about religion. 92% of our culture is all about religious duty. And we put so much stock in going to church. And I love the church. If you know me more than five minutes, you know my passion for the church and all that God has done for us. But going to church won't change your life. Attending and hearing won't do it. Jesus says, that's not what I'm talking about. You got to go the next step. You got to go to obedience. You got to go to the application. You got to move to the doing. That's where it really makes a difference. James says it this way. Hearing and doing look a lot like looking at yourself first thing in the mirror when you have bedhead. You know, it's all sticking out. You have bedhead and your hair is doing all the crazy things and you look at it and you go, ah! Oh, that's just me. And you go to work and you don't comb your hair. You don't brush your teeth and nobody wants to. They're all scared that day. We got to do something about it. And that's the doing part. Obey now and endure the storms later. Disobey now and you will face certain collapse later. God has you here today on purpose. The question is who? Are you going to trust? Where are you going to dig the foundations of your life? 
It's a simple little philosophy. Follow, believe, obey. That's it. Follow, believe, obey. Follow, believe, obey. The goal is to be so convinced of who Jesus is and so grateful for what he has done that you willingly choose to do what he says. Father, today we honor and glorify and lift up the mighty, powerful, matchless name of Jesus, the author of life. And Lord, as the author of life, you know the beginning from the end. You know what works and what doesn't. The culture teaches things that are so counter, uh, they, they seem right, but Lord, when we look into your word and we explore the truth, we know that they aren't right. And I've never met a person who followed Jesus for 30, 40, 50, 60 years of their life and said, what a waste. I've never met that person, but I have met countless people who lived just 20 years of their life in unhealthy states of the world and who looked back at nothing but destruction, destroyed marriages, destroyed children, children on all kinds of things, to, you know, to, to all kinds of problems. I, I've met people, Lord, who, who didn't put you first in their finances, who didn't listen and obey to save and to give and to, to do live third, Lord. I, Lord, I, I've met those people, and Lord, their lives are chaotic. But you, Lord, give us a simple invitation to follow. Just explore who you are. Lord, you give us the next invitation to believe. To believe who is the one teaching us that it is Christ, the living God. And Lord, a, a simple third step to just obey all that you've said because of who you are. And Lord, I pray today that you would help us as a church to get our priorities straight. We can't be obey, believe, follow. It's got to be follow, or believe, obey. If we reverse it, Lord, we will walk away from our faith. It's too difficult. But once we realize who it is that's giving us the instructions, we can have confidence, Lord, because we can see long term. When we know who it is that's saying us, our, our short term begins to go more long term. So God, Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would move in each heart, in each mind, in each soul. And Lord, bless us today with not only hearing and doing, hearing your word, but also taking that step of faith and doing your word. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.